Now at nine, Missouri Southern breaks ground on the future Roy Blunt Health Science Innovation Center. Plus the latest on a lawsuit against a Joplin police sniper who killed a two-year-old in Baxter Springs. And we'll see what life in Knoll, Missouri is like now six months after the closure of the Tyson chicken plant. The four states most watched news starts now. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Tanya Bach. A new court motion is seeking to release the name of the Joplin police officer who fatally shot a two-year-old girl nearly two years ago. KOAM's Amber Jenkins is live in studio with more details. Sniper One, a Joplin SWAT team officer, fatally shot two-year-old Cresslin Crawford while responding to a domestic violence call in Baxter Springs in March of 2022. The Cherokee County Sheriff's Office responded to a call from a woman asking for help at 340 Wyandotte Avenue in Baxter Springs. When officers arrived, Eli Crawford shot Taylor Schrute and went back into the home with two-year-old Cleslin. According to the police, Eli started shooting at officers. The standoff lasted more than three hours. When law enforcement was able to approach the home, they found Eli and Cleslin dead inside. The KBI investigation indicates that two-year-old Cleslin Crawford died as a result of a single round fired by an officer from the Joplin Police Department. That Joplin officer, also referred to as Sniper One, petitioned the court to remove their identity from the records to avoid public scrutiny. Now a motion is requesting the courts to release Sniper One's identity. The court document states the profound interest of uncovering the truth far outweighs the privacy of Sniper One. After reaching out to the Joplin Police Department on the matter, we received a statement from Chief Pearson stating that the case is closed and that the department has no comments. I have been in contact with Cheslin's family. We'll hear from them next week. Tanya, back to you. All right, thanks, Amber. Well, Pittsburgh police arrest two people in connection with the overdose death of a teenager. Police started investigating last April after 18-year-old Cooper Campidi of Frontenac died of a fentanyl overdose. And then yesterday, they arrested two suspects believed to have sold Campidi the drugs. Official charges against the suspects are pending. Authorities have arrested a couple of people after getting information that drugs were being distributed out of a Web City home. The Ozark Drug Enforcement Team assisted the Web City Police in serving a narcotics search in the 700 block of Jillian Lane. Officers say they found narcotics and drug paraphernalia. Two people, Donald and Summer Tunnel, were taken into custody regarding numerous outstanding warrants. A Neosho, Missouri school counselor has turned himself in for a statutory rape charge. Authorities say 40-year-old Jacob Oaks sexually assaulted a minor several times from 2021 to this year. After turning himself in today, he immediately posted bond. The Neosho school district says Oaks, who works at South Elementary, was put on leave when they became aware of the allegations. Chief Meteorologist Doug Hetty joins us with a first look at weather. Well, it turned out to be a decent uh, Thursday for us today. Temperatures not too bad, uh, still below average for this time of the year. 64 started at 49. Average high is 68 degrees for this time of the year. Let's go outside. We're mainly sitting into the mid 50s right now. We are dry after the rain that we saw yesterday, <clears throat> but our temperatures, most of us are still kind of hovering into lower 50s and the winds are starting to calm down. It was super windy earlier today. These will continue to calm down for us as we go through the overnight hours. Not a whole bunch going on. We'll have mostly clear skies for us tonight behind the system that gave us all the rain yesterday. So as we go through the night cold, we're going to drop back to 39 degrees, but right back to 56 by 10 a.m. Big warm up for the weekend. We're going to look at that here in just a bit. All right, thanks, Doug. Carthage City Council tonight held a special meeting following Tuesday's regular meeting, which you are seeing here. Now at today's meeting, they voted to dismiss City Administrator Greg Dagnan from office. However, Mayor Dan Reif said he had to approve the dismissal along with the council and that he would not. And there was also a motion to impeach Mayor Reif but that was tabled in favor of hiring an outside attorney who could lead the council through the process. After lengthy discussion, the council, minus Dagnan, went into a closed session. 
Six months ago, about 1,500 people's destiny was undefined as the Tyson's plant in Knoll, Missouri was closing its doors. KOM spoke to some former employees to hear what their lives look like half a year later. They said the burden has been especially difficult, both emotionally and financially. All of them are like family. We have all gone through a lot during the time that we were working together. We were trying to stretch our money as best as we can. We were trying to, you know, make sure we had everything we need in the house, food, um, a place to live, everything. Both, both Harper and Bradshaw chose not to work at the plant until the very last day. They were afraid they'd be unable to find a job when many of Tyson's workforce were also job hunting. Now tomorrow we will hear more about how the closure of the plant impacted Knoll and its local businesses. The groundbreaking of Roy Blunt Health and Science Center was held today at MSSU. KOM's Anthony Saviello was there and has reaction from the former senator as well as students and faculty. It's the beginning of the newest face of Missouri Southern. The Roy Blunt Health and Science Innovation Center breaks ground and is just two years away from being what campus president Dean Van Galen describes as the campus crowning jewel. The Health Innovation Center will be front and center. It will be on the oval, so as you drive by the campus on Newman Road, uh, this will be the iconic building that you see on the campus. It also houses our Welcome Center. It also houses meeting space for the community, so uh, it'll be the new front door of Missouri Southern State University. Former Missouri Senator Roy Blunt is the name that is attached to this facility. He says his focus has been on the improvement on the future of health care in Missouri. What the health world looks like right now to, at this minute is nothing like it looked like 10 years ago and frankly not what it will look like 10 years from now. I think for Missouri uh, uh, Southern that the uh, opportunity to have this innovation center is a great way to keep more in that discussion. Southern students say that this new building can now be a selling point to attract new students. If you really think about it, we are struggling in health care. We need more health care people and having these types of buildings are going to make it to where people want to come here and they yeah. want to experience this and they want to learn and become a nurse or a doctor yeah. or whatever. Um, and so having these facilities is really important, I feel like. President Van Galen says that this building will also allow students to be on the forefront of serving a need in southwest Missouri. There are great workforce needs for uh, well-prepared health care professionals and that's what we do at Missouri Southern certainly in their disciplines as a nurse uh, or a dental hygienist but we provide also a broad-based education that prepares them not only for their first job but for their entire careers. Reporting in Joplin, Anthony Saviello, KOAM News. Well, construction of the new facility is set to begin in the coming weeks and is set to wrap up before the 2026 school year. Coming up, why Consumer Reports is calling for schools to stop serving students Lunchables. An investigation into a popular packaged food is raising alarm. Consumer Reports is asking school cafeterias to stop serving children Lunchables. The watch, Watchdog Group tested a dozen versions of the lunch kits and found several contained high levels of lead and cadmium. The heavy metals can cause developmental issues even in small doses. The study also found concerning amounts of sodium as well as phthalates, chemicals used in plastic packaging that are also known hormone disruptors. When you have these type of lead readings um, and lead being linked to, to learning development issues, uh, we have to rethink what we're making available uh, in the school food program. Kraft Heinz, which owns Lunchables, defended them, saying many of its products are a good source of protein and that a food's nutritional value should be based on a whole product rather than a single element. A bit of hope for families whose children have been diagnosed with the most common form of brain cancer. There's been a breakthrough thanks to the fundraising efforts of a determined father and the doctors at Children's National Medical Center. It could save lives and avoid the terrible side effects of the current treatment. Fox News Chief National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin reports. 
It's simply the worst thing that a father or a mother can hear. Frederico Goldstein was just nine years old when he was first diagnosed with a life-altering brain tumor. Until the discovery, he lived a healthy life in Brazil, loved to read. His father, Fernando, says he read every Agatha Christie novel. It's very sad to, to see a kid suffering from, from, from cancer particularly because they have the whole life ahead of them. Medulla blastoma is the most common form of brain cancer in children. 500 new cases are diagnosed in the U.S. each year. The current treatment, developed in the 80s, leaves kids with lifelong cognitive and developmental problems. Technology and medicine have evolved tremendously in the last decades, decades, but unfortunately not for kids with brain tumors. Frederico is now 17. When he relapsed, his father teamed up with a leading children's brain tumor specialist in the U.S., and the Medulla Blastoma Initiative was born. It sometimes took between 10 and 15 years to go from a discovery to a new treatment to proving that the treatment is better. Raising more than $10 million in just over two years, they are now on the verge of two clinical trials. Every dollar raised contributes to the research behind a cure. We know that we have a long way ahead of us, and we still need more support and more people helping us to help all of these kids. Jennifer Griffin, Fox News. Doctors have identified a danger in homes that could be increasing the risk of lung cancer. While most lung cancer is linked to smoking, about 15 to 20 percent of patients never smoked. Researchers at Ohio State University say colorless, odorless radon gas is linked to a growing number of cases and more Americans should be testing their homes for radon. Doug is next. A complete look at your forecast. And later, a front at Kansas softball standout signs to continue her career at the collegiate level. Well, of course, a little bit warmer for us today and a chance to dry out across the region, but still we were a few notches below where we should be for this time of the year, but it looks pretty good right now. Here's a nice shot of our Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex Tower Cam from 7th and Joplin Street looking off toward the northeast through downtown Joplin. Pretty much clear skies. We have a few little clouds which are skirting through, but overall it looks pretty good. Not a whole bunch is going on across Central Plains behind this storm system that gave us the rain over the past couple days. Now we have a ridge of high pressure which is going to start to roll in. What that means for us is we get some pretty nice weather as we go through the next few days. Plus, we get a warming trend as we go into the weekend. Then this storm system off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, that will start to affect us early next week. And what that's going to do for us is give us showers and thunderstorms. Everybody in the yellow, this is on Monday, could have strong to severe thunderstorms and even a higher probability once you get into the orange southeastern Kansas northeastern Oklahoma, then over toward Wichita and Oklahoma City. By Tuesday, the greater risk spreads to our east, but still, especially on the Missouri side, we could get some severe thunderstorms early Tuesday afternoon. So this is definitely something we want to watch. We are going to have the threat for all modes of severe weather, hail, winds, and tornadoes, but still four days away. So we have a lot of time to kind of break this down and uh, alter the forecast just a bit. But the weekend looks great, but showers and thunderstorms will develop out across central Oklahoma and then spread in as we go through the overnight hours Monday night. And then on Tuesday morning, another little round of showers and thunderstorms, and then all this will push off toward the east. So this is our next bigger storm system that we need to keep our eyes on. Until that one gets here, we look okay. It's going to be chilly tonight, about 39 or 40 for an overnight low. Going into your Friday, plenty of sunshine, lower 60s by noon. I think most of us will get near 70 for a high for Friday afternoon. Tomorrow night, not near as cold. We drop back into the mid 50s. And then as we go into the weekend, Saturday, we push 80 by the time Saturday afternoon rolls around. So a big warm up for us over the next few days. Cold start 40 at 7. We're going to go all the way up to 70 for a high temp tomorrow, which is pretty good. And the winds, they've been calming down over the past couple hours, but they're going to get moving again. Not so much tomorrow. Tomorrow they're going to be fairly light, but by Saturday afternoon, we're going to have gusts again, kind of in that 30 
to 35 mile per hour range. All right, 70 tomorrow. Let's go 80 on Saturday, 84 on Sunday. Those thunderstorm chances Monday and Tuesday. And again, some of those could be strong, possibly severe, and then cooling down a little bit late next week. But overall, we're shaping up pretty good. Tanya? All right, thanks, Doug. Well, the Joplin Health Department will begin its efforts to control mosquitoes. The department plans to use fogging and larvicide treatments, although they are using a low toxicity EPA pesticide. The department recommends people stay indoors when the fog is visible. Make sure and close your windows and bring pets indoors during treatments. Residents can opt out by contacting the health department. Fogging routes are posted on the city's website. Ottawa County residents today had a chance to learn about resources available to those affected by the Tar Creek Superfund site. Federal, state and tribal officials were on hand at the Miami Civic Center for an open house to connect people with resources and answer questions about cleanup efforts. Now today's meeting focused on the importance of getting children blood tested for lead poisoning and free soil cleanup for residents. There are things being done. Um, it's, it's not safe to swim in Tar Creek these days, but you know, eventually maybe it will be. But right now, the remediation is going to take a few decades, and when it's done, maybe we'll have uh, usable land out here and it'll be safe. The Tar Creek area was designated as a Superfund site decades ago following high levels of chat pollution. Coming up, robots are taking over at Walmart distribution centers. What the company says about their output. Menards in Joplin will officially open next week. Store officials today announced Tuesday is the big day for the home improvement store at 3317 South Geneva Avenue. They plan to host a special grand opening celebration on Sunday, April 21st through Saturday, April 27th. That will include wood carvings from a chainsaw carver, John Gage, and Menard's race cars on display. Walmart says autonomous robots in its warehouses are almost doubling the output of regular employees. Fox's Ashley Webster reports. This is an AMR, or Autonomous Mobile Robot, and thanks to AI programming, it can precisely unload and store a truckload of goods in record time. These robots can unload, repack, and ship out 560,000 cases a day, almost double the amount regular employees can produce. The items are separated by a machine, they're sorted by a machine, and evaluated by a machine. So what about the humans? For our associates, it has actually made them more productive and it has uh, evolved their labor-intensive jobs into high-skill tech-focused jobs. So while the humans supervise an array of mechanical arms, scoops and sensors twist and turn in precise movements. The robot machines process the packages by size, weight, even content, meaning for safety, items like baby food will not be placed next to items like laundry detergent and all of it controlled by algorithms. Those algorithms also control storage carts that zoom around a dark labyrinth highway in the warehouse. These mechanical arms are programmed to assemble the perfect pallet of goods, which they do with mesmerizing accuracy. Even the shipment labels are AI generated down to the exact store and aisle number it's destined for. Walmart says AI is not replacing workers. In fact, the employees are learning new tech skills while the robots do all the hard work. In Brooksville, Florida, I'm Ashley Webster for the Fox Business Network. Up next, Pitt State hosts an event for Special Olympics athletes to promote a healthy lifestyle. Pitt State today hosted an event for Special Olympics athletes. The school's therapeutic recreation program hosted the terrific field day to promote a healthy lifestyle. It included fun activities as well as the Treats and Trails program, which takes people along Pitt State's hike and bike path that extends from Kearney Smith Stadium to the Kansas Technology Center. Our main goal today is just to have fun. Um, this is their day to just um, have no worries, um, enjoy the activities, and just participate. The theme for today's event was Wild West. 30 more minutes of news, weather, and sports is coming your way. Students in McDonald County see what their lives could be like through a simulation event. Plus, the IRS puts a warning to file your taxes before Monday's deadline. 
You're watching the Four States Most Watched News. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Tanya Bach. For those of us that have to do it, we call it adulting. For 7th and 8th graders at Pineville Elementary, the chance to jump into the roles of adults for a day is called a fun and eye-opening experience. KOAM photojournalist Ty Parks went to the elementary school today to experience the real-life simulation event. <laughs> A real simulation, and that's R E A L L, which stands for Reality Enrichment and Life Lessons. They have two different sessions. They have a reactive and a proactive, and so they get a think of the game of life. They get a simulation where it tells them how old they are, how many kids they have, what kind of job they have, whether they graduated high school. Um, or not, and then how much money they owe in rent and things like that, and it gives them an idea of after high school or when they drop out, if they didn't finish high school, what life could be like. Oh, Dialy, you don't have an account with me, so I'm gonna have to take back thirty so, or good. twenty. So the tables are organizations. It, you have a place where you get to go pay rent, or you have a place where it's the bank. Um, there's also interface services. There's a childcare place. There are two tables for jobs, one where you go get employment and the second one where they actually give you the job. And when you get that job, they actually have to wait five to seven minutes like they were working before they can go anywhere else. They even have a jail. I got an old car that breaks down often. I have uh, twins and they're at the babysitter right now. And uh, I got, I just got fired from my job because I came late three weeks in a row and uh, I dropped out of high school. And I go to work 10 hours a week at an insurance office. I have a car, so I have a monthly travel pass and I'm currently being evicted because I didn't pay my apartment bill, apartment bill and I have not paid for my child care either. So. I'm a lot in day. <laughs> so between the two situations where there's reactive and proactive, which is the second half, they will get to see what it's like to not have a goal in life that you're reaching, um, that you set to get there, um, and that they, I hope that they see that they can be successful, they can reach that goal, and it would be better for them to continue reaching that than to just kind of react to every situation. Even before I knew I wanted to like go to college, but I since I have like a bachelor's degree in the game, it shows me that like if I go through college, I'm more likely to get a better job, have more money to pay for everything that I need to in life. If I have a probation officer speak to, <laughs> to and not go to jail <laughs> and uh, you know, don't make dumb decisions that's going to hurt you in the future and uh, make sure you uh, get all your bills paid on time so you're not behind and you're not stressed out and feel like you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. So be sure you have your life. Good life lessons there. Well, Pineville Elementary School and the Ozarks Area Community Action Corporation partnered to bring to life this one of a kind event. I'm sure a lot of work went into that. Well, those life skills will pay off come tax time, which is fast approaching for most Americans. Taxpayers have until Monday to submit their returns unless you request an extension. The IRS says tens of thousands of taxpayers have already filed free of charge using their new direct file tool currently available in 12 states. Now, most people who qualify for refunds will see them within 21 days. Two out of every three taxpayers that files with us is owed a refund. Uh, and people want their refunds quickly as they should. Um, and we want to get people's money in their pocket. Our mission at the IRS is not necessarily to make it fun, but to make it as seamless and as easy as possible and to give taxpayers options and to serve them uh, wherever they are and, and what they need. If you need to file an extension, you can go to irs.gov and fill out the appropriate form. If you owe the IRS but cannot pay by the 15th, the agency says you can set up an installment plan on the website. A bit later, how college athletes are cashing in on record viewership.
Well, of course, a little bit warmer for us today and a chance to dry out across the region, but still we were a few notches below where we should be for this time of the year, but it looks pretty good right now. Here's a nice shot of our Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex Tower Cam from 7th and Joplin Street looking off toward the northeast through downtown Joplin. Pretty much clear skies. We have a few little clouds which are skirting through, but overall it looks pretty good. Not a whole bunch is going on across Central Plains behind this storm system that gave us the rain over the past couple days. Now we have a ridge of high pressure which is going to start to roll in. What that means for us is we get some pretty nice weather as we go through the next few days. Plus, we get a warming trend as we go into the weekend. Then this storm system off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, that will start to affect us early next week. And what that's going to do for us is give us showers and thunderstorms. Everybody in the yellow, this is on Monday, could have strong to severe thunderstorms and even a higher probability once you get into the orange southeastern Kansas northeastern Oklahoma, then over toward Wichita and Oklahoma City. By Tuesday, the greater risk spreads to our east, but still, especially on the Missouri side, we could get some severe thunderstorms early Tuesday afternoon. So this is definitely something we want to watch. We are going to have the threat for all modes of severe weather, hail, winds, and tornadoes, but still four days away. So we have a lot of time to kind of break this down and uh, alter the forecast just a bit. But the weekend looks great, but showers and thunderstorms will develop out across central Oklahoma and then spread in as we go through the overnight hours Monday night. And then on Tuesday morning, another little round of showers and thunderstorms, and then all this will push off toward the east. So this is our next bigger storm system that we need to keep our eyes on. Until that one gets here, we look okay. It's going to be chilly tonight, about 39 or 40 for an overnight low. Going into your Friday, plenty of sunshine, lower 60s by noon. I think most of us will get near 70 for a high for Friday afternoon. Tomorrow night, not near as cold. We drop back into the mid 50s. And then as we go into the weekend, Saturday, we push 80 by the time Saturday afternoon rolls around. So a big warm up for us over the next few days. Cold start 40 at 7. We're going to go all the way up to 70 for a high temp tomorrow, which is pretty good. And the winds, they've been calming down over the past couple hours, but they're going to get moving again. Not so much tomorrow. Tomorrow they're going to be fairly light, but by Saturday afternoon, we're going to have gusts again, kind of in that 30 to 35 mile per hour range. All right, 70 tomorrow. Let's go 80 on Saturday, 84 on Sunday those thunderstorm chances Monday and Tuesday. And again, some of those could be strong, possibly severe, and then cooling down a little bit late next week. But overall, we're shaping up pretty good. Tanya? Well, a massive, thanks Doug. A massive cicada invasion is expected to hit parts of the U.S. as early as this month. For the first time in more than 200 years, 13 year and 17 year cicadas are reaching adulthood and emerging from the ground at the same time. 16 states, mainly in the South and Midwest, will be swarmed by trillions of them, with Illinois and Iowa expected to experience both broods. These cicadas uh, don't have mouth parts that can hurt us. Uh, they're sap feeding insects, um, so although they are a, um, a nuisance um, uh, as far as noise outside goes, there's no harm uh, they pose directly to you. In fact, some people eat them. Um, that's their own thing. I would say um, just enjoy their emergence because this phenomenon doesn't happen all the time. I'm going to pass on the eating them part. Cicadas can damage small plants and trees, so experts suggest using netting to protect them. Coming up in sports, our final Thunder Thursday segment of the regular season. Plus, Colgan and Galena baseball square off in a doubleheader. John Dales has highlights from that and more up next. Enjoy the hey, welcome into sports. I'm John Dales. It's our final Thunder Thursday of the year here on Fox 14. The NBA regular season comes to a close on Sunday. Then we turn to the playoffs. Now the Thunder try to finish the regular season strong. They've got just two games left. OKC is currently tied with the Timberwolves for the two seed in the West. Both of them are one game behind the defending NBA champion Nuggets. 
who will hold the number one spot. These final few days will be pivotal, pivotal for playoff seeding. You can catch one of those very important games right here on Fox 14. The Thunder host the Bucks in our final Thunder Friday night of the year. Tip-off is at 7. Wrestling fans, you know the drill. You can catch WWE SmackDown in its entirety after our newscast tomorrow night. One of the top high school softball players in Southeast Kansas signs her letter of intent this afternoon in front of friends, family, and classmates to continue her career at the collegiate level. Frontenac High School senior Abby Beeman signs her letter of intent today to play softball at Avila University in Kansas City. Beeman is a three-time first-team All-State outfielder from her freshman through junior years. She says that she first heard from Avila over the summer and the decision-making process didn't take very long. It was this summer or last summer at the California tournament, which is actually our last tournament. And then I went on a visit there and I just knew, so it felt like home. It's something that I feel like a lot of kids dream of and the fact that I even get the opportunity is just crazy. So. Switching gears to high school baseball, Colgan and Galena meet for a doubleheader in Pittsburgh this afternoon. Both of them playing very well recently. Galena and Colgan meet on the baseball diamond for the first time this season. Future Emporia State Hornet Gus Keller gets the start on the mound for Colgan. He gets the swing and a miss to end the second. A few innings later, Keller gets called strike three. Then with runners on, it's Keller who throws a nasty breaking ball here. Six innings pitch for him, 10 strikeouts for Gus Keller on the day. Now to the fourth inning, Colgan leads one nothing. Jack Letourner makes a nice catch on this comebacker. Throws to get the runner out at third, gets the Bulldogs out of a jam. Still low scoring game going into the fifth. Colgan leads two to nothing, but Jack Schremer hammers this pitch in the left field gap. That brings in two runs to score. Colgan cruises to an easy victory after that. Panthers beat Galena eight to nothing. And the Panthers make it a clean sweep of Galena. They win the second game as well. Tristan Voss makes his 2024 pitching debut, going six innings, striking out seven batters, and he picks up the win. Colgan has won four games in a row, and it plays next at Parsons on Monday. Another pro sports story for us in Major League Baseball, the Royals win again today, they win big. That's their seventh win in a row, very early in the season, but they're nine and four through 13 games. Well, they can keep on improving. And Hope so. Get us yeah. those wins. We'll see. Do you think they'll end up with a pretty good season? I do. I think they'll be a lot better than last year. Coming off a 100-loss season, really the only direction you can go is up. But right now, the way they're looking, that they could compete for a playoff spot. All right. Thanks, John. We're back with more news after this. This year's NCAA tournament saw record TV ratings. Massive viewership numbers are not just good for the sports, but are also raising profiles of players who can now earn money off their name, image, and likeness. Michael Yoshida takes a look at how money off the court is continuing to change the landscape of college sports, including a new way for people to try and make money investing in college athletes. Hi, it's Caitlin. I'm so excited to be partnering with H&R Block. To launch College athletes. When the odds get beaten, the chicken fingers get eaten, baby. Capitalizing on endorsement deals. My name is Olivia Miles. I'm dropping my t-shirt. It's become a really big part of the game. There's a lot more added pressures, I'd say, you know, to get your business going, to get an agent, um, to build your brand. They're also cashing in on their name, image, and likeness from NIL collectives, operating independent of schools, these pool funds from boosters and other sources. It's basically like negotiating with a, a general manager in the NFL or NBA, um, but at, at the college level. And obviously, the higher the prospect, the more the money. College football is the biggest NIL sport. Every school in the Southeastern Conference or SEC has at least one NIL collective. It's helpful for me. It made my name pop out and come out more. Opportunities continue to expand. New company Nilly pays student athletes up front for their NIL rights and pairs them with a financial advisor. If a kid is able to learn about money, to invest properly, that goes a long way. And allows fans to invest in the athletes. We believe that this is a really good deal for, for all parties. Nilly earns revenue from the athletes' NIL rights and shares it with investors and the athletes who receive a majority of the profit. We didn't have this. 21 years ago when I came out of high school and 
had to go to the pros because of my financial situation. It's time for the athletes to be able to control their own destiny. I'm Michael Yoshida reporting. Well, coming up, a stolen goat who ended up stuck under a Kansas City bridge is finally back home. We'll have the story of its return. A mountain goat in Missouri has had quite the adventure over nearly two months time. He was stolen from a farm weeks ago and then this week spotted on a ledge below a bridge in Kansas City. What? But now after weeks of being on the lamb and his rescue, Chug is finally back home. Morgan Mobley has more. I know. Here, Brittany Slaughter, Chug's owner, never thought she'd see her goat again after he was stolen from her farm a couple months ago. Yeah, that's him for sure. A couple days ago, she saw him on the news perched about 80 feet above ground in Kansas City. We couldn't believe that it was the same goat and we were, I sent the picture to probably 30 people to look at it and see if it was him. That was her chug spotted on a ledge below a 63rd Street bridge. No, the bridge was, it was a surprise because like I said, he's just a field goat. So the whole mountain goat thing kind of caught me off guard and I was like, mountain goat, huh? No kidding. But now it's time for Chug to wrap up his urban adventure and go back to where he belongs. It's been a long time since he's seen any of us and so we're just hopeful that he warms right back up as soon as he gets home. Poor Chuck. <laughs> That's our time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're going to leave you with video of baby meerkats at a German zoo. Have a great night and an even better tomorrow.